this is Efforts in secure, uh, Scaling Application Security Programs with Eric Fay. Eric is an information security leader currently specializing in application security. He leads the application security program at Hulu as the manager of application security in Santa Monica. Throughout his career, his responsibilities have covered protecting the applications, infrastructure, and web presences of the major brands Dow Jones, Wall Street Journal, Market Watch, and presently Hulu. Please welcome Eric to Shell 2018. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining. I know there's a lot of good talks, and we're at the very end of it, so let's try to get through it real quick. Uh, yeah, so really quick, I'm going to start off with a really quick intro. Uh, name's Eric Fay. Uh, lead up the AppSec program at Hulu. Uh, so we're based out of Santa Monica. Uh, been there for about four years. Uh, native Scrantonian, so throw any office references you have. Scranton Strangler, uh, I can't think of a few other ones right now, but uh, throw them my way. Uh, so before that, I was working at uh, InfoSec and Dow Jones. That's supposed to be a GIF, but it's a PDF. So we we'll to change it, change it over. Uh, so for the agenda for this, um, this is primarily going to be a retro for you know how we started and built out and scaled and kind of kept up with the success of Hulu over time uh, for the application security program. So uh, no awesome blockchain demos or anything, unfortunately, for this one. It's primarily going to be a retro, uh, but. You know, the reason for why uh, I wanted to create this talk was a lot of retro talks I saw like earlier years back were very useful for me and kind of seeing other people when they were in similar positions, what they did, what they tried to focus on, prioritize, things they built, things of that nature. Um, so I'm hoping s some of these things that we've done are helpful for you guys in the audience as well and can, can take away something useful. Uh, timeline, like I said, 2014 to yesterday-ish to future state. Um, I put some current stuff in there, so hopefully we can kind of go over that. Um, and I broke it into very loose phases of open pastures, expansion, maturing, and future. So again, I didn't have a lot of uh, you know, quarterly breakdowns. This is going to be very strict. It's going to be super wide open and big. Um, so the first phase was around 2014. I joined Hulu. Um, and I broke it into a few different sections in each of these phases as well. So just to describe the landscape of, um, you know, Joined first AppSec hire there, a uh, really small security team overall. Uh, the, at the time, there was a lot of smart engineers and developers creating great features and products that only some of them cared about security, but it wasn't a primary focus. Um, so the very agile development processes, um, you know, deploying was everywhere, always, constantly, probably right now. It's kind of still that way, to be honest, but it's a little bit more matured in this, this uh, overall process-wise. Um, and at the time, there was a lot of monolithic applications. So if you were to go on to www.hulu.com at the time, you were practically touching one to two Rails apps. They're gigantic Rails applications. Um, and as a service, there was free video on demand, which was very ad heavy. Uh, you create an account, get blasted with ads. Um, and then there was a subscription video on demand, which would essentially monthly cost. And then it was slightly less ad blasting at the time. Um, so yeah, then some of the goals that we laid out um, for this were, these are a little bit more soft. Again, this isn't, there was nothing in place, no focus um, on application security at all um, outside of, you know, people were smart engineers and cared about the product and feature that, features they were releasing. Um, so some of the first things were just learning the lay of the land, really, and just figuring out what the most critical um, workflows were for the business and for Hulu overall. Um, you can imagine things like our sign-up flow, uh, ad playback, content playback, uh, authentication, things of that nature. Um, figuring those out, focusing on uh, finding risk and vulnerabilities in those critical workflows that we mentioned, um, and establishing relationships with some of the dev leads and team tech leadership um, to, again, just create a relationship with these people as we're working through and helping them kind of secure their applications and services. Um, so some of the actions we take, again, a little bit more software. We started getting, um, getting towards that towards the end, a little bit more technical work. Met with dev leads and tech leads and just you know, stated the purpose of what the team was, what the program was, what we were trying to do, and how we can possibly, how we can help them out while they're building um, and scaling their services. Uh, we learned architecture of the services, again, of those critical workflows primarily, figuring out what uh, applications and services that um, you would touch when you're going through some of those critical workflows that we mentioned. Um, then from there, we focused manual and automated security testing on those critical workflows. 
Um, and again, as I mentioned before, uh, at that time, it was one application security hire, and I was the first person shaking the tree on vulnerabilities on the application level. So you can think um, a lot of stuff came out, and you know, to be honest, a lot of it was low-hanging fruit. So one of the first things we did was we acquired some VAST tool that would find those things that are a little bit easier to identify um, and automate away things like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, things of that nature. So then we can focus on doing more manual testing, uh, business logic abuse testing in some of those critical workflows. And some of the lessons learned, um, like I said, da the DAS tool that we had was finding low-hanging fruit. It wasn't finding very intelligent things, but you know that was kind of doing its job at the time. Um, and establishing some of those relationships with the development leads at the time was very valuable. It created feedback loops of, you know, just setting up syncs monthly, bi-weekly, or even quarterly is super useful at the time for us. And I still have some of those connections for folks that still work at Hulu. So it's been really valuable to just know what they're working on. They'll ping our team and say, hey, we have concerns about this, this product or feature. Can you check it out? And just, again, it's a great way to just be v viewed as collaborators and not that team that's just blocking, here's a list of vulnerabilities, go fix it. I'm type of just spewing out reports. Obviously, that's not a very good uh, relationship to have with the development team. Um, and just a side, small, smaller note, success criteria has changed a lot. Um, you know, we still go through and pick tool, tools and reevaluate solutions. And um, I think at the time for us, when it was the program was, was brand new, um, it was a heavy focus on automation and no configuration. Like, just give me a URL, just test it. I don't want to spend my time configuring scanning tools for you know, hours on end for a scan profile for some DAS tool that's gonna give me a few more XSS C-surf. Um, when I'd rather be trying to find logical issues with, again, critical workflows, which is a lot uh, more important uh, in my eyes. So the next phase, next looser phase was the expansion phase, naming it 2015, 2016 for us, vaguely somewhere in those two years. Uh, some of the landscape at the time, just kind of, again, explaining what was there, what's, what, what we've been doing. Um, we're now familiar with a lot of the critical apps and services. Um, we've identified and miti mitigated some immediate risk. We found some issues when it, we've been able to automate away some of the lower hanging fruit vulnerabilities and detecting those. Uh, we're the security go-to for a few teams, which is great. Again, having those relationships. Uh, for us, we were in the one to two, actually, I think it was 2.5, AppSec engineers at the time, somebody was part-time uh, helping us out, triage some, some findings. Um, and we have a baseline scanning tool, just trying to find some, again, low-hanging fruit. Uh, Lance, more landscape for Hulu, uh, teams started to move to, development teams started to move to mi more microservice architecture around this time frame. So those major monolithic applications that we had started, teams started pulling functionality from those and then creating microservices to Pull that out so, you know, if a team didn't want to, uh, they want to change some, func fun some functionality of a s an application, they didn't have to deploy this entire monolithic multi-million Rails lines of code for Rails compared to just one Python app that's a couple hundred lines or something of the sort. Um, so, and as a service, we got rid of FOD, that disappeared. Um, subscription video on demand, same, same product, and we added no ads for subscription video on demand as well. And we started adding some add-ons um, at the time, around that time frame. Uh, some of the goals for this process uh, were to create, we started creating tools to automate some of these processes and vulnerability identification, uh, expanding some of the tool coverage we mentioned before, and security, getting security into the SDLC because a lot of what we were doing at the time was just looking at the external production surface that we, that we had out there. And beginning to do some secure code education at the time as well. Uh, so here's some of the actions we took during that time frame. Uh, we acquired a RASP tool, and we integrated it into one of our those monolithic applications. They're still there. Again, it was minimizing being some of the functionalities pulled out of it. Uh, integrated there was doing some analysis on and protections against things like cross-site scripting, SQL injection, uh, cross-site request forgery, stuff like that. Um, we also started a bug bounty program at the time. Uh, I know this is kind of arguable uh, for a few programs for when they should start bug bounty programs, how they should do it. Uh, we started it rather early. Again, we had like one to two AppSec engineers at the time. 
Um, but we took it very slow, kept it private. It's actually still private to this day. Uh, but since then, you know, we started like five to 10 researchers and that really helped us augment a lot of that manual testing. And we found a lot of severe issues that came out of that program um, that would have required a lot of manual testing. Um, again, no need to rush into it regardless of what vendor is trying to push you to go public just to get that brand name up there, but side vendor rant. Um, and then we started building some tools, like I said, to identify vulnerabilities um, and then also automate away some of the spot checking we were doing um, at the time for discovering vulnerabilities. Uh, so one of those tools that we wrote, we created a tool for automatic static code analysis for those Rails apps. Again, it was still a decent amount of coverage at the time. So we used Leverage Breakman, the open source static code analysis tool, and we created a system that would um, listen to um, Git hooks, and any time a code, code was pushed to a Rails app, it would listen, clone it down, run the scan, and save the results off into a database that we had locally uh, for this, this service, breaky break, we're calling it, um, at the time. And we would actually uh, notify developers of you know, who was ever the author on that commit to say either, depending on if they introduce new vulnerabilities or they reduce vulnerabilities, um, so we would email them and tell them like, hey, great job, you remediated like five vulnerabilities, awesome, or hey, maybe check out this commit because you just sent a SQL injection out to production. Oops, uh, type of notifications. So we also built, and I'm gonna hop in some, just show a little bit of the tooling that we built as well. Uh, a lot of the other stuff was either, you know, uh, at the time trying to automate some of the manual testing we were doing or monitoring our external surface that was at this point very much changing as teams were creating new microservices. They were, the external surface for Hulu was changing pretty constantly and, you know, uh, nobody's selling a security team, obviously, at that time. Uh, so we built something to monitor that external surface. We also built something to monitor the TLS health and grade and quality of the configurations that were going out at the time. And also we had one or two issues with S3, so we created a monitoring tool for that as well, checking for very loose configurations and access control. Uh, we also held some security docs for the security code education. So we were able to pull metrics from things like our bug bounty program from our DAS tool and tie that back to certain teams that we knew were introducing cross-site scripting a little bit more than others. And we were able to sit down and just set up quick talks with them to go over you know, what these issues are, um, how to fix those things. Um, and you know, it was really useful because again, it created more feedback loops that you didn't have before when a whole development team sitting there listened to um, to uh, the security team, tell them about these issues and say, hey, this is a real world situation. We're running through these right now. Um, so at the time, it was a little bit more ad hoc. Excuse me. So I muted this a little bit, um, just some of the entries. Uh, we can talk about it if you have any further questions afterwards. Um, but this was our app that we built for monitoring external applications. Um, so internally, we have a platform as a service system that developers provide code to, code to just like kind of almost like a Heroku and they get infrastructure and their app is running on infrastructure they don't have to worry about. Um, so this hooked into that and also our load balancers to see whenever a new external VIP was created to try to tie it back to an application that existed on that past service. So I'm not sure, I'll read these off if you guys can't read them too much, but um, so we are actually able to talk to a few different APIs, pull what domains were associated with those applications so we have domains, um, the name of the past system, so the name of the application in the past system, uh, what VIPs, and we're able to pull from a few different sources, get team owners, dev owners, which is really important for us if we find issues, and we're able to easily go back and say, hey, this is the app and team owner, let's go talk to, talk to them to go fix those issues. Uh, when we first found it, whether or not our web application firewall was in front of it also, um, and we're able to pull th some things like uh, weekly average requests per second and uh, you know, the average, um, and also the backend count as well to say like, you know, is this a change if we want to enable a WAF on this application? Are we actually having to do redeploy for something that has 50 backends or is it just like one to two, which is a pretty big um, difference, obviously. So, and this led us to, um, got us a lot of different, or a lot of good metrics from this, this platform. Like we're able to say, Again, look at something like language distribution and say, you know, well, what was this? What is this language distribution that apparently more than 60% of the teams are using? Should we be focusing on doing secure code education or tooling for, say, this is Python? For us, it might be at this point. Um, for Python, 
rather than why are we wasting our time looking at job applications if it's just a certain sliver, like a few percent percentage points. So it drove us again to be able to ask these focus questions and focus and drive some of our product, uh, products or projects a little bit more. So this is another one that's also monitoring external surface. We nicknamed it, how's my TLS? So it's almost kind of this, a little bit, it's pretty similar. It was just pulling off our, um, our subdomains, our domains that are externally facing to the world and popping them over to ssllabs.com. If you guys are familiar with it, it just gives a grading of how good a TLS configuration is, what protocols and ciphers are in use. So really that's all the system was and would just throw all the domains over to SSL labs that were applicable, give us a grade back out. And again, I muted some of the information. We had a similar distribution kind of like this with protocols and um, protocols and grades as well. So um, there's, I think, some, somewhere in 100 plus, but it gave us a holistic view of, you know, at the time, TLS termination was happening in a lot of different locations. It wasn't really just solidified out, well, you know, for us, is on the CDN, is T TLS being terminated on the CDN, is on the load balancer, is it somewhere else, some other piece of hardware. So we're able to dig in and say, oh, great, who lives on an A? But there's some other ones that aren't so great. Why is that? Again, to drive those questions, we're able to pull those metrics and drive those questions and initiatives to go dig into, well, why are our Netscaler configurations so terrible compared to something that's on Akamai? And is it missing a standard? We could create a standard for TLS from there as well. And I've been pushing that a bit. So that's been useful for us. Again, more muted stuff. I apologize for that. But just given the, the high level of Another tool we created for, you know, from our bug bounty program, again, pulling metrics from these different tools, we kept running into issue, one or two issues with loose configurations on S3 buckets, which our team did not want to keep paying for for bug bounty programs. Um, it's pretty frustrating, so we created a tool to automate that. Um, and off the bottom, again, it's just the name of the buckets, what the read write, what teams had read write on those buckets, um, and, you know, what type of access was a global read write was it just certain teams so then it would this would proceed to just alert us go in s3 api check all the buckets get these permissions and if there was something that we deemed a little bit more loose it messages somebody on the appsec um, channel so a little bit more uh, chat ops type of tool there so going back some of the lessons we learned uh, for us the rast tool and again i wanted to keep this a little bit more honest i don't want to sit here saying how great everything is we've done because it's not uh, for us, the RAS tool integration we did was a very high effort of integration from the security engineers and from the development engineers or development uh, developers as well for getting it slotted, doing the testing, and for our team to manage the infrastructure that was supporting it, the underlying infrastructure supporting it. Uh, so that, we scrapped that. Uh, it was in a mo one of the monolithic Rails applications, and as it kind of did not help that we were going to more microservice architecture, so it was only covering a certain chunk that was getting minimized over time. Um, so that didn't work for us, we scrapped it. I'm sure it works for other people very well, but at the time it didn't work. Um, like, I, like I went over, monitoring tools, we primarily focused on creating stuff that automated the way um, manual spot checking that security engineers were doing um, for you know, certain issues, and then also a way for us to track external surface so we can drive, gather metrics and drive initiatives and focus things, uh, focus things for our team. And for us, the bug bounty program was an immediate return. I mentioned before, we found a lot of good issues that were helping us at the time with one to two engineers, um, helped us augment a lot of that manual testing that we had. Um, and you know, we're to the point where it's still ongoing. We've been doing it for two to three years, and I think my advice would be just do it slow. There's no reason to go fast into it just because, uh, just to get to the, the sake of saying you have a public program. Um, and focus stocks, again, I, I would I keep saying this because of how valuable it is to have those feedback loops with different teams, especially as an organization is growing, features are, more features are coming out, subscriber bases or user bases are going up, uh, new teams can create all the time, so it's good to have those, um, those feedback loops that you, that you established. So the next phase is a little bit more current. This is 2017, 2018 down there. Um, so this is a little bit more current day for you know, what we're trying to get to, what we're focusing on, um, so this is a little bit more applicable to what the current environment is. So we have three to four AppSec engineers on the team right now. Um, our teams are moving to more centralized CI CD processes and workflows. Um, everything's microservice practically now at this point. Um, 
you know, there's a front end that's talking to a lot of different APIs that talk to more APIs, and downward it goes. Um, and for, in, I mean, for instance, a quick stat that past system I mentioned before, um, I think is somewhere around multi-thousand applications there on there now. Um, it's not all prod, app, prod applications, but it goes to show that they've been, a, there's a lot of usage of smaller applications that only do certain things. Um, and as far as Hulu went, um, pretty similar, SVOD, no ads, subscription video on demand, more add-ons, uh, as well as now we have a live TV service um, as well, which was released during the stock frame, 2017, 2018. Uh, so some of the goals, some, some of the things we try to change, focus on a little bit more, now we're in a more maturing program, is to remediate classes of vulnerabilities. Classes of vulnerabilities, again, not trying to fix every XSS that's ever occurred, rather than starting to question, well, why is this occurring? Is it a framework issue? Is it a tech issue? Is it an education issue? Um, and again, we should be able to pull some metrics from our tooling to, to be able to drive, drive like some of the projects to fix those. Um, or things that are org-wide risks, things that are affecting you know, maybe all subscribers and compared to maybe certain smaller amounts or subsets of subscribers in certain instances. Uh, getting security further in the SDLC, like I said, we didn't get super far at this point up until, up until this point. Uh, internal team efficiencies, you know, it was a very small team spinning in circles a lot, so there wasn't a lot of formal processes. We started to get reeling those in. Um, and formalizing security education as well, is something that we kind of focused on for this, this phase. Uh, some of the actions we took, so we acquired a static code analysis tool, bigger vendor, Enterprise One, because that Rails one we built as I said, we went to more microservices, Rails, those app, big, gigantic applications go, went away. Uh, so we did an integration into our CI CD pipelines that we were mentioning before. Um, and it was something that we acquired a tool and created an onboarding process with the aim of trying to minimize the effort for the development teams and just being able to have a sheet of saying, these are the steps you need to do to integrate into your pipeline and to, you know, what the expectations are. Um, so one thing that really helped us with this was uh, finding a vendor that was able to provide some level of triage for us on the front end, and really formalizing that process throughout helped, and I think, uh, I think we'll talk about it as a return. But, uh, some of the other things, uh, security involvement into other teams' processes that were already there were kind of hooking into processes. So this one specifically was our, um, develop, our DevOps team had a process for um, when somebody would request for an application to get exposed externally, we kind of hooked in that and said, hey, let's you know, gather some information, do a little security assessment on it quick, um, and get some spot checking before it goes out. And at this time, we also uh, acquired a WAF solution, uh, get to that in more detail, and acquired some education content and put it into an internal LMS or learning management system that Hulu had at the time. Um, and we started playing around with content security policy in production, which was um, also definitely, definitely interesting. But to the, going back to the point of what we were able to build from the external exposure process, so to give more context, like I said, a team would go on to JIRA, request a ticket, uh, say, I need a VIP to expose my microservers out to the internet. We're like, oh, might as well throw it over to us as well. So we, instead, we kind of flipped it and said, now, it's, whenever you need something exposed, just go on this checklist, fill out a few things, and some of the things we listen here are secure code educate or secure coding best practices to give us more context of how the application was developed in time. Were they thinking of um, certain issues or vulnerabilities? Um, and it helped gather a lot more context. You know, if it was something that was like a marketing page that was going out, static page, we don't care. We'll instantly pass it by. Something where they're saying false on these things and saying they're not following these best practices, maybe we should take a look at that a little bit more in depth before it goes out. Um, so some of the lessons learned here, um, the stack analysis was very valuable. Again, it pushed security presence further into the SGLC and it got a lot closer to the developers than we were beforehand, focusing on work that was in production. Um, and again, formalizing a process for that, those teams really helped out instead of just like throwing documentation over to them, obviously, and being able to throw them, get them on a very formalized process really helped. At this point, I think we've onboarded, um, it's around 30, 40 applications. They're all scanning in the pipeline now, so it's still a work in progress, but it's something that's been really valuable for us. Um, and hooking into established processes, it was a lot of for lower friction interactions compared to us going out and saying, hey, we have to, you have to check everything 
uh, by security beforehand, which isn't a great ask. Everybody's not going to be too excited compared to just hooking into something that was already there, doing a quick spot check, getting some context before, behind the applications as well. Uh, we formalized some assessment processes, like I mentioned that one beforehand, the external exposure one. We had one or two teams um, essentially just created some work queues and created some on-calls for ap application security engineers to say, hey, for the week, um, handle the queues for assessments or handle um, our bug bounty triaging. Um, so, so one person wasn't sitting there for months on end arguing with uh, bug bounty researchers for being paid an obscene amount of money for cross-site scripting or something of the sort. Uh, so we don't want any burnout there. Um, for us, the WAF integration I mentioned was a high return. We were able to get it, uh, it, get it into a good integration. Um, as I mentioned before, that PASS system, um, we were able to get it, work with our DevOps team to enable a one-click deployment for the WAF.